have uh, a few guest speakers who will introduce the evening. The film is uh, uh, 77 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A afterwards, so we have lots of time. Um, but tonight's uh, screening is co-presented by the Planners Network, uh, the Urban Planning Association of Concordia, the Institut de Politique Af uh, Alternative de Montréal, the SPCA Student Association, Geography Undergraduate Student Association, and is supported by the Sustainability Action Fund and Concordia Council of Student Life. So thank you to all our supporters for tonight's screening. Thank you for all coming. And now I would like to invite up onto the stage Norma Rantisi, who is the director of Ur the Urban Studies Program at Concordia and is also with the Planners Network, if you want to come up on the stage. Thank you. Hi, thanks for all being for being here tonight. Um, and I want to thank Ezra and Svetla and all the crew at Cinema Politica for the amazing work they do and just a testament to how valuable these fee levy groups are um, here at Concordia. Thank you. You can give them a round of applause, actually. Yeah, we think it's worth it. Is there really? um, and I just wanted to start by just saying briefly a couple words about Planners Network, which is an organization I've been working with for the last 13 years. It's a nonprofit organization. It's essentially an international organization of planning professionals, activists, academics, and students who are concerned with transformation, physical, social, economic, and environmental planning. Um, to promote fundamental change in our political and economic systems to make them more sustainable. So if some of those themes are of interest to you, if you're interested in progressive planning issues uh, more generally, there is a clipboard going around. Um, you could just sign on with your name and your email, um, and we can provide you with some more information about some upcoming activities. Um, but now for tonight, I want to introduce um, Martin Blanchard, who's going to speak uh, briefly now, um, who's a community organizer at Comité Logement de la Petite Patrie, I hope I didn't mess it up, which is a tenants' rights advocacy group in Petite Patrie, Montreal. And Martin has been fighting for tenants' rights since 2001. Um, under the influence of past studies and philosophy, um, at the same time, he also has been writing uh, essays on housing from a philosophical perspective. He'll be completing a book this year with Christian Nadeau of the University of Montreal on housing and that will deal with issues that include gentrification, tenants' rights, private and public property, and that will also put forth concrete solutions to poverty and injustices that have been generated today by housing inequalities in modern societies. So I want to start by uh, bringing, asking Martin to come up, and he'll be speaking a bit about the Montreal context just to help set the stage, and then we'll introduce um, the director of the film who we're very privileged to have here in Montreal today. Thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone that invites me tonight. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to have a little word on gentrification, what it means uh, from a general perspective, but also uh, what it means here in Montreal, so we can have a little idea of what, gentrific what gentrification means in Montreal when we look at the movie. Uh, gentrification is about displacement. It's about the displacement of poor, normally it's going to be poor tenants that are displaced of their living neighborhoods because there's a new class, a new a richer class that comes into a, a neighborhood. This is why gentrification is an issue, because the fact that people move in and out of a neighborhood is not an issue uh, in itself, but displacement of poor person by richer person that just by the fact that they are richer can displace poorer persons is in itself an issue. Why is it an issue? It's because it's a social justice issue and it, it takes on poverty, it, it aggravates the problem of poverty, and this is why housing becomes a poverty issue, becomes a social justice issue. And what happens in your Montreal about, about gentrification? Well, some of you may know that we have a, quite a good law here. Uh, we have a rental board, uh, there's, there's a, a civic law for uh, defending tenants, and it's, I mean, the law is okay. The problem is that uh, it is not well applied, it is not well defended, 
and the tenants sometimes don't know really what is their rights. But also promoters, real estate uh, agents, municipal officials, notaries, owners come into a neighborhood and they force the tenants out of their, of the, of their houses. How do we see that? We see that by pressure. We see that by they buy the people out of their of their houses. They will so tenants will be offered three, four, five thousand dollars to get out of their apartments. May sound like a good deal when you get the three thousand dollars, but if you have to pay two or three hundred dollars more for your apartment, it's not quite a good deal at all uh, in the in the long term. Uh, and th so there's all all these tactics that people have to kick the tenants out of their apartments and then sell the apartment at a at a at a good at a good price to a richer people or even or even rent the place to richer people and it could be just some people could say well it's normal it's the market it's how it works but it's not normal it's not natural and i think the movie will show something that it's very important it's a collusion it's corruption it's people that play together a game against people that are less, that are disadvantaged uh, in their, you know, against people that are disadvantaged. It's not natural. What's happening, it's a game that, it's people that game the system in order to make a big profit. There's nothing natural in there. And what we see uh, here in Montreal, actually, uh, tomorrow, Comité de la Petite Patrie will do a press conference to show that the rental stock has been converted in condos in Montreal at an extremely fast rate. And there's a law that prevents conversion of rental stock in condos. So how does it happen? Well, it happens because the law was created, created with holes in the law, and people take advantage of these holes. Do you think that the holes just happen to be there? I don't think so. I think that somehow it was... And if you look at the, the way the law had worked for the condo conversions, it's clear. In the 80s, there was a, a law that prevented the conversion of rental stock in condos in 87. In 1994, a new law comes in that say, well, you can have a, another type of condo. And then with this other type of condo, you can do some conversions in condos. So, it's clear that when you have a collusion between administrative officials, city, city officials, real estate promoters, notaries, it's clear that we don't have a natural system. We don't have just something that happens to be the market. We have something else. So I think that the film tonight by Kelly Anderson will show what is happening in Brooklyn about that kind of collusion, how people get together to kick out poor peoples and make a profit. But uh, it happens, it is happening right here in Montreal right now. And people are being impoverished and kicked to the periphery of the city because of what's happening. And the first duty we have is to say no to the owner when he wants to take the apartment. It's, we have the duty to say no to a rent hike we have the duty to keep the rental stock for, for every, every person, for every, um, every tenant in the city. So anyways, if you want to talk about that after the film, I will be happy to do it. So I'm going to introduce um, Kelly Anderson. I've been asked to do it. <laughs> so Kelly Anderson is a director, producer, and editor, and an associate professor professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at Hunter College at the CUNY. <laughs> she recently completed Never Enough, a documentary about clutter, collecting, and Americans' relationship with their material possessions, which won an award for artistic excellence at the Big Sky Documentary Festival. Nice. Kelly's other work includes... <laughs> You can applaud, eh? Bravo. <laughs> Kelly's other work includes Every Mother's Son, 
with Tammy Gold about three mothers whose children were killed by police and who became advocates for police reform, which won the Audience Award at the Tribeca Film Festival and aired on POV. Anderson and Gold also made Out, of, Out at Work, which was at the Sundance Festival, Film Festival and aired on HBO. My Brooklyn is a documentary about gentrification with a focus on a historical significant site, the Fullerton Mall, the process of its transformation and what it means for the local community. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you everybody. Um, I really want to thank Svetla and Ezra and Norma and all the other groups for bringing me here. Um, I, um, About two years ago, I was um, here, I live in Brooklyn, and I was here on vacation, and I wandered into this kind of anarchisty bookstore, <laughs> probably pretty close to here, and I saw this brochure, and it had, it said Cinema Politica on it, and it had this picture of Angela Davis, I think you were showing the Black Power mixtape at that time, and I, and, and I was deep in doubt and insecurity about this film, about whether it would ever be finished, and I was, I picked it up, and I was like, wouldn't it be great if I could just show at this thing in Montreal one day. <laughs> and I brought it home. <laughs> and I tacked it to my wall, and it's still there. And lo and behold, you know, two years later, I, um, it happened. So I'm really, really happy to be here. And the other reason I'm really happy is it's a very significant thing for me because I was born here in Montreal, and I was raised here until I was 15. And, um, And I don't really come back too often, and I don't really know too many people here anymore, although I think there may be some people here that I went to, like, elementary school <laughs> with, and they need to make themselves known if they're here. Um, but um, I guess, you know, I always kind of couldn't figure out if I was a tourist coming back here or if I was belonged here or what. And I just I felt like, wow, you know, I really get to come back here. And to, to it's a kind of coming home for me that's really interesting because listening to all these groups up here and s doing all this radical work and all this really interesting stuff, it really felt like, God, you know, home is not really about geography. It's like about being with the people who believe in the stuff that you believe in. And I just, I feel really happy to be here for that reason too. So, um, so I'm really, really looking forward to discussing the film with you and thank you all for coming. What's important about de Blasio is less that he's from Brooklyn and more that he's a progressive person. Um, and so he is definitely trying, I think, to put a more progressive imprint on policy in the city. Um, you know, he's got a lot of pressure coming from the real estate industry and the other side, um, all of whom were freaking out when he got elected and he was trying to appease them and tell them that, you know, the world wasn't going to end for them when he became mayor. But, um, you know, he's done some good things. I mean, I think what it's going to look like is not necessarily the kind of change I would want to see. Um, what he will do is insert the mayor's office to force more affordable housing out of big new developments, for example. I think he's going to use the mayor's office more aggressively to get in the middle of um, some of these deals as they're being worked out, which still are going to happen behind closed doors. So I think the problem is we're not going to revive, we may, but up to now I haven't seen any, implement, any proposal that would really increase citizen participation in planning and stuff like that. But I think that he does bring a more progressive um, agenda. And the people he's appointing are, by and large, better. Yes. So uh, I think it's marginally going to be better. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, the jury's out, really, on it. We're all hoping. But we have to keep pressure on him, too. I do think there are ways that artists get used in this whole process that's unfortunate. So in downtown Brooklyn, um, after they evicted those 20 businesses on Willoughby Street, the first thing they did was invite a whole bunch of artists into those empty storefronts and gave them the space so that they could create their work. So I don't 
blame them for not knowing, but it definitely had the impact of sort of art washing what was going on there because people often, a couple people said to me like, oh, it's so great that the city gave those abandoned storefronts to artists. And I was like, no, no, those weren't abandoned. They kicked the people out before they put the artists in. So there's a, there's a lot of this process that's just people aren't aware of what's going on. Um, I think everybody needs affordable housing. I think artists need affordable workspace. I mean, the thing that's going on in, in New York right now is that artists are getting evicted from all these industrial spaces in Sunset Park, where I moved to, um, after being displaced from Williamsburg and from all these other neighborhoods. So I think that there's a, a, an obvious crisis, um, especially in a city that considers itself the creative capital of, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so I... I I think that the point of our film is that you really can't blame anybody for moving anywhere, um, but that it's really the government's role to um, have policies in place that allow people to put down roots and um, stay where they're living if they want to stay there and not be displaced. So I think that it's sort of um, one of the reasons we made the film was to try and point out the policy parts of this, because I, I think making anybody feel bad about where they're living is not productive politically. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think people should try and be aware of their impact. I mean, I knew when I moved into Fort Greene that my presence there made the area more valuable for real estate development. So there's also that. Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of discussion about how to deal with small business displacement in the city. Um, and usually the conversation comes around to we need some kind of commercial rent stabilization, um, which I don't know if you have it here, but I'm curious to find out if you have something like that. We have none, and it's considered a political non-starter is how they talk about it. But that may change with the new mayor. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, we do have residential rent stabilization. I don't think it's, it applies to as many buildings as what you guys have. It's only a certain percentage of this, the rental stock in New York. But that's the only thing that's keeping it affordable at all. So um, I think that that's what has to be done. Um, and the other question was about, oh yeah, well, basically what's happening is that all the people that are displaced from central Brooklyn are moving further out, and then all the people who live there are getting displaced further out from there. So we have a homeless population in New York that's higher than it's been since the 80s. I mean, we've never, I think since they've been counting the homeless, it's never been as high as it is now. You wouldn't know it if you were a tourist in New York because it's, all the shelters are built far out of the city, but there's a huge housing crisis. Um, so um, it's, yeah, and the the transportation problems are huge as well, you know. It's uh, all the injustices that come with being geographically further away from the center city happen. Yeah. I definitely think that could happen. In New York, we have not seen any depreciation or devaluation of real estate. I mean, it's there was like a slight leveling off during the financial crisis and then back up. Um, I think the reason for that is that everybody after 2000, well, during that real estate bubble, the idea was to put your money in real estate. So a lot of those condos are not, no one's living in them. That The people who bought them bought them for real estate investment. So people will say to me, those buildings are empty. I walk by there at night. There's no lights on. They're technically sold, but a lot of them have nobody even living in them. So there's like part of it is just spec real estate as just a speculative commodity that you don't even have to live in in order for it to be functioning in this the system. So um, that's, I think, a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're somewhat, I mean, if you look at the, they're technically occupied, but they're not totally occupied, yeah. I mean, it's hard to track that stuff, like, it's really hard, any of the information, even in this film, was, like, so hard to find, just, what was the subsidies? I mean, nobody's making that readily available, so it's really hard to find out who's living, but if you look, you'll see that who owns them is, like, so-and-so realty trust based in, you know. Hong Kong or whatever. You know, there's like a lot of like, I mean, not to single out Hong Kong, but you know, there's a lot of foreign investment, yes. I feel optimistic that we elected a progressive mayor. And you know, there's talk in other cities like, oh, we need, you know, who's gonna be the Bill de Blasio of Chicago? You know, and like nobody was talking like that before. Everybody was saying like, who's gonna be the Bloomberg of, you know. So I think we're seeing a kind of, um, a realization that this sort of like crazy rampant free market 
you know, capitalism is not the only way to develop cities. And I think people are starting to be pissed off a little bit who've been on the receiving end of that um, for all these years. Um, whether it takes the form of more citizen involvement. I think that I would hope that we would see in New York City a return to sort of empowering community boards, making their votes, you know, not just advisory, but actually mean something that they would be better funded. I mean, there's many mechanisms for a more democratic situation, but they've been sort of starved and alienated and pushed to the margins. So I, I hope that, I just, it's very early in this new mayor's tenure. So, um, you know, like with schools, you know, I think he's really doing a lot to push back against charter schools and empower, you know, parent, I don't even know if that's a thing here, charter schools. Um, you know, privatizing public education. Um, there's like a lot of really big issues that I think um, people could be more involved in. I just don't know whether the change is gonna be like, now we have a mayor who's more progressive, so we're gonna have these policies. I mean, I, I would like to think that we could really empower people more <laughs> from the bottom up, but um, it's unclear to me now whether it's just a change of regime with a better vision. I think you can move there and then you have to fight for just, you know, t I think you need to involve yourself in the neighborhood to protect other people from being displaced and you have to be really involved in the community. I mean, I think what happens a lot is people move to a community and then, like the case with the music in the plateau, they want to just shape it to their vision because they have this sort of sense that they discovered the neighborhood and now they can make it what they want it to be. Um, so there's that. So I think people just need to have good politics and be good citizens of the neighborhoods that they move into and not be jerks. I mean, really, like, the, you know, the number of people in Brooklyn, black people in particular, who say to me, you know, people move into my neighborhood and they don't look at me, they don't say hi to me, they act like I'm not there, they act like I, you know, they even sometimes look at me like, what are you doing here? You know, so, I mean, there's a certain amount of that that's just, like, not being conscious of, I mean, there's policy, and that's all really important. I think there's also just being a good person, you know, and that takes a lot of work, and it takes being involved in your community, and not just, you know, blowing off all the community stuff that's going on because you're tired or you worked late or your kids, or whatever, you know? I mean, I'm guilty of that, too, somewhat, but I try, you know? So I think it's about, for example, I moved to Sunset Park, okay? There's a bunch of... Latinos and Chinese people who use the park there very well and some newcomers like me and all of a sudden this thing starts circulating on the parent Sunset Park parents listserv which is mostly Sunset Park gentrifier parents listserv and so and they start saying well we don't like these vendors in the park because there's so much trash and they sell these ices which are like little ice creams and they people throw the trash on the ground so we should call the police to arrest the vendors and enforce the vending laws so this to me was an example where you can't just like, delete the email and forget about it, because it's really important. You can't start calling the police on all these undocumented people who are making a living selling stuff in the park, right? So uh, there's countless ways that you can intervene. I mean, one thing that does make me happy about the film is even though it doesn't show all of this community resistance achieving a good end, because that didn't happen, um, you know, it do people have told me that they relate to the city differently since they saw it, you know? So confronted with a new thing, a couple of weeks after they saw the film, they react differently than they might have otherwise, you know? And I think like that kind of knowledge is a really good thing. And so I think it's just about wherever you're living, like treat it like your home and be good to the people who were there before and don't um, disregard them. So thank you, Kelly Anderson for coming. And clearly the thing to fix Brooklyn is uh, Cinema Politica. You need to start one. <laughs> <laughs>